we'll start with a little Q&A with Robert. And um, uh, what I'll do is I'll ask uh, groups that have a group question or a group request to hear more about something to, uh, to be the first. Susan has a microphone and Lori has a microphone over there. So who, what group wants to ask a question? speech you said about what well, a lot what we can do locally but I feel like could you go into more like how you feel like these small acts of protest or like these organizations can help build like systemic change because a lot of the during a lot of the classes I've taken and studies it says that this is mostly a systemic problem that's causing this huge homelessness and it needs to be addressed systemically. So I, so do you feel like providing these like, um, these education to like homeless m might, m might lead to larger systemic change? Yeah, man, totally. Um, I'm, I'm Fundamentally, that is what I'm interested in. It's just, how do you get there? So, as I alluded to earlier, I think there's an incredible synergy between, as weird as it sounds, millennials and boomers have huge shared interests. And the food system is one such place. You know, there's a huge, I believe, a huge nexus. And one of the reasons I focused on seniors this time around is seniors vote. They're the most reliable voters in America. And this potential for the boomers and millennials to find common ground really intrigues me. I'm also very interested in the idea at, of nonprofits as drivers of the economy. Just so you know, this is, a, this is, in my opinion, an economic fact. There is no profit in America without nonprofits in America. It's just a straight out fact. I mean, sometimes we look at nonprofits as this lesser than kind of thing. Um, and I can talk at length about gender origins, which I'm fascinated by. But at the end of the day, you can't attract people to Olympia, let alone businesses or you can't get people to stay here long term if there isn't arts and culture, communities of faith, education, health care, clean air and water, open opportunity. It doesn't work. So the idea of trying to find a way to challenge those old archaic norms, you know one of my favorite kind of things to, to challenge people on is uh, I, you know, I did not go to college um, and yet thanks to the power of the commencement address you're looking at Dr. 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 Eggert. <laughs> God bless America. <laughs> but um, you know what I find fascinating? Is my generation on graduation day says to a generation again, raised doing service, almost to a person, we say in effect, congratulations, choose. Do you want to make money or do you want to do good deeds? Do you want to be a dot com or a dot org? And the really, the, the the, the insanity, the economic stupidity of trying to force 100 million young kids to choose between one or the other is obscene, it's absurd, it's foolish, it's dumb. Um, and so what I hope is that one of these revolutions is that your generation will say politely but firmly, no, man, that's, that's not our bag. That's, not, that's your generation's baggage. We don't live in dots. We don't deal that way. We want, it, we want both. That's a revolution. You know, earlier when I was talking about um, the boycott, and the power of boycotts, this might sound a little abstract, but all of those movements I talked about were all built around the concept of nonviolence. Yet, you could make kind of a philosophical leap that, in effect, a boycott is a form of violence. It's economic coercion. It's not, nonviolence isn't just, I didn't hit you, you know? So that idea of, well, it worked though, it proved a, a massive point that if poor people don't participate, the system stops. Well, I'm interested in, in, in effect, the, the positive alternate to that, which I like to call the boycott. You know, the, the idea of us as consumers saying, God bless America, man, if you as the president of a company want to make $400 million, that's your right, but I have the right not to participate. It's in effect a generation saying, you know, 
F. Milton Friedman. You know, I don't have to participate in a system that says the goal of business is to make a bunch of money for the stockholders. The future is not a consumption-driven economy. It's a consumer-driven economy in which we recognize that what Dr. King, what Gandhi, what Chavez, what Thompson, I mean Clarkson prove is that market forces can be driven by regular working people. And it's, as, as the band Fugazi said, it isn't what they're selling, it's what you're buying. You know, so for us to actually own that idea. So let's, let's take it a step further. What happens if the mayor of Olympia and all the nonprofits of Olympia got together and said, we're gonna create a seal. And every time you, you shop, volunteerism is great, yay, but that's not gonna solve the problem. But the rest of the week, when you go out and spend money in the larger economy, look for this Oly Olympia seal, because every time you spend your money at one of these businesses, you decrease the need for meat. Every time you shop here, you increase the treasury. Every time you shop here, you, in, you decrease the need for the mayor for the city council to raise taxes. Keep the money local. That's the future. And so those ideas of how do we as consumers participate in the larger system, it's a very powerful idea. And speaking of participating, boy, I tell you, what's better than knowledge? Pi. Uh, and I'm going to take this minute to do a, a, a thing. Pi Fest is coming up, and I urge you all, um, if I was here, man, I would so be down there on February 28th. This is a, an event that's raising money for senior nutrition uh, and the food bank and a variety of other great organizations, and I urge you all to go to Pie Fest and eat a big old slice of pie for me. And go to Grub, too. I really want to thank the folks at Grub for giving me this groovy t-shirt. Another question, please. Comments, thoughts. Yes, my handsome brother. Hi, my name is Ken, and I volunteered at an institution for the mentally ill in Singapore, and I hang out with them, and I play chess and stuff, but I wonder, how do you help them to be productive? Because they are on medication, and right. I, I can't see how they could be really productive. Well, you know Some what's interesting them. is, A, um, Singapore, along with Hong Kong and, and Tokyo and Seoul, are really outposts of social enterprise, and I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of nonprofits becoming businesses. Um, I'm trying to create a business in Los Angeles that, in a nutshell, will say that I will create a business, and I will go out and buy from farmers the fruits and vegetables they can't sell because they're cosmetically imperfect. They get disc under. And again, as I suggested earlier, half of the food we throw away is, the, is cosmetically imperfect fruits and vegetables. So I want to say instead of I can, I can wait, I can do the charity thing and wait till this food is so on the verge that you call me up and give it to me because I'm a charity, or I can come out a week and a half early, two weeks early and buy it from you for 10 cents on the dollar. It's business 101. Farmers are ecstatic to have that opportunity, right? So with the first five years, the business plan I have for the LA Kitchen is to buy about five to seven million dollars directly from local farms in the food they can't currently sell that is thrown away, right? Secondly, I'll do a job training program, and graduates of that program will earn $35 million in new salaries based on jobs they'll get either outside of the LA Kitchen. Once they graduate, what the jobs I will create to do a new contract food business that will create a healthier um, alternative to the current um, senior meals program in which the contract, $12 million in LA contracts go to senior meal contracts in which a multinational company produces the meals, processed meals, and the profit leaves now never comes back. So again, get this, I'm saying to the mayor, you have a choice. This is every mayor in America has a choice now. And this is, a, this is exhibit A. You can watch all that money leave town and never come back, and you can put the bill for the health care costs for those older people who are sitting in isolation or you can invest in a new alternative in which a nonprofit becomes an employer themselves. The era in which we can train people and say, okay, we've done our, you're trained now, go out and find work in the larger economy. You know, we were talking earlier, man, who's gonna hire the felon? Who's gonna hire the person who struggles with mental health or, or a former addict? Who's gonna hire um, a person who has to have an alternate schedule because they're caring for a parent with Alzheimer's at home? There's no incentive for the larger business world to do that because they still salute and bow to Milton Friedman, which says that will cost too much money. We're the ones. So the idea of creating the jobs, not hoping that those men and women will find jobs, that's the big leap. So there's many examples of men and women finding employment who have mental challenges, for lack of a better phrase. For example, in, in Japan, there's cocoa vineyards that produces one of the best champagnes in the world and some of the best shiitake mushrooms, and it employs numerous men and women who are, I, I hate these old words like mentally retarded or whatever, but you get my point. It's just a matter of us liberating our minds for what we perceive as deficits, not often the people. People who have those issues, they don't see those deficits that we do. 
So I think what we're looking at is instead of come see wrapping our heads around this idea of disability, I think we have to really really be explore our version of ability. So, but again, I think that's sometimes our baggage. But I'd like very much to become. I think that's the big thing is. Um, and if, I, I'm sorry I'm ripping here, but here's another classic example. The Bureau of Labor Statistics produce, predicts over the next 20 years, the number one job in America. In the next 20 years, what do you think it's going to be? Anybody? Home health care rate. You know how much it pays? $19,000 a year. Yeah, but the point is we can either accept that, and if we accept it, then we better immediately start raising money to buy food for our pantries because all those people are going to be lining up because they'll never make it in America. Or we say, in effect, well, why don't we create those shops? Why don't we own those companies? You know, imagine the option of saying, wow, I can start a company, I'm producing these meals, and I'm training young men and women aging out of foster care, and older men and women coming home from prison. The idea of an intergenerational job training program, can an older man and woman only find, coming home from prison after 20 or 30 years, find their, their road? Can they stay on that road by helping a younger person not make that same mistake that they did? And in fact, say, you know, I'm gonna stay, anybody here who's dealt with addiction, Many people stay clean and sober by helping somebody else stay clean and sober. It's the buddy system. So the, it's that idea of, of trying to find a way to capitalize the buddy system and create businesses built around that. You know, the business I'm looking at producing has to be a profit sharing business. Because if I'm gonna hire older men and women coming home from prison, I can't ignore the fact that they spent their earning years behind bars. And I can't create a business feeding old poor people and create more old, old poor people. So the idea of going aggressively after profit, saying to the city, I want every contract you've got. Let's keep that money local, but when you partner with me, again, I'm going to reinvest in the people we employ by matching their retirement plans two or even three to one, as much as we can. Aggressively say, this is what a new business can look like. If a city looks at the nonprofit sector and says, you know what, let's get it on. Let's leave behind this foolish notion of charity does this and business does that and let's vigorously explore, and let's allow those young men and women who are surging out of universities and colleges like Evergreen to come to City Hall and say, you know, I've got this wacky idea. You know, let's make it Evergreen, or let's make it Olympia. Another question? Yeah, please, man. Thank you all so much, man. I'm really honored. This is really cool. I'm very, very grateful. So uh, what I would like to know is, you talked a lot about aggressive nature of pursuing change. Um, how does a small business team up then with a nonprofit or a possible nonprofit and then try to make a change locally <coughs> while the business tries to grow as well as grow that nonprofit? Well, you know, I'm interested, one of the things that, that limits nonprofits is our access to capital. You know, unlike a traditional business, now just so you know, man, last Friday, I signed a $2 million loan uh, to build my new kitchen. It's the first time I ever built something new. I've always used the existing resources. But because of supply, we're going to be trading in tractor trailer loads of, of fruits and vegetables out of California and demand this massive need for an aging population. And even though we'll have other business streams, I had to build something big enough to do that. But I went out and had to borrow that money. And that's, that's big league ball. I, I have new respect for people in the business community. Anybody here a small business owner? You know, I, I tell you, the, 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 the labyrinth you have to go through to get a loan was so unbelievable, but unlike a business person, and again, this is the power of buying local, I didn't have to sign my house. You know, I signed a loan, my business has to pay it back, but I'm not personal. I, when I went through that process, man, I, I've really become more and more impressed by just small business in America. But that idea of how do we get access to capital, this is why I'm fascinated by elections and mayors. Because historically, we in the nonprofit world, we go up when somebody's elected, we march up to try and educate the new people. I want to let people who are already educated. I want people to show up on day one saying social enterprise, keep them on a local, rock on, let's do business. The idea of, of cities saying, in fact, do you have a business idea? Why doesn't the city invest in it? I mean, literally, why don't we invest in business and become owners of business? Why don't we invest in Olympia? I'll give you a crazy idea that passes. I've told it a couple of times, but if in 1986, anybody in this room had invested $1,000 in Microsoft, you have a million bucks in the bank today. And that's that's real serious. That's that's like Matt, that's what it would be, a million bucks, probably more. But if in 1986 you had given a thousand dollars to Mohammed Yunus, who founded the Grameen Bank and won the Nobel Peace Prize for the idea of microcredit, you know, and this idea that even the poorest person can manage debt and repay a loan. This was a really 
fundamentally crazy idea that this Bangladeshi economist proposed. And this is really important, I'll do this really quick, man, that he was in a rural village visiting a small rural village in a town in a country that he loved. And for many of you all know, Bangladesh, since it's, it's founded in the early 1970s, is perennially, perennially at the very bottom of the economic ladder. I mean, it is perennially, you know, disease, cyclones, famine, but he loves it. Just as you love Washington, he loves Olympia. I mean, he loves Bangladesh, but he was in a rural village and met a group of women who were literally lamenting the fact that they were, they had been indentured. They were in, literally in bondage to a local money lender. And he asked, you know, how much? And they went over and, you know, talked and came back and said, $27. You know, and he stopped and he's like, now this is, you know, again, it's, it's that this is the difference. This is the moment where so many in the room will have a similar ability, a similar knowledge, a certain little nugget that they can turn, but like so many people, I would have done the same thing. I would have been like, dude, 27 bucks, boom, down. You know, literally in the village, woo, like just good. You know? <laughs> but he's like, whoa, 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 I'm an economist. I know better. I know if I just give them this money, it's charity. And eventually they might be free for today, but they're going to go back to the money lender tomorrow. I haven't changed the system. And he looked and said, I don't see any reason to believe that you as a woman don't have the same entrepreneurial burn as a man anywhere else. You just don't have access to credit or capital. I'll tell you what I'll do. Who wants to launch the business? And I will loan you the money for this business, and you can pay me back. You pay the money lender back. You're free. And that was the birth of microcredit. Now, if you had given Muhammad Yunus $1,000 when he launched that movement, all you would have been eligible for was a one-time tax deduction because you gave to a charity. Now, why not an annual tax deduction with decreasing value based on the same rate of return principle as a dividend check that the nonprofit organizations can show verifiable economic return? How many people didn't go back to prison? How many old people stayed out of the nursing home and stayed active and productive? There's a thousand different metrics that we haven't explored. It's just an algorithm. And it's just an elect, it's just electing a generation of people who aren't burdened by this idea of dots and dot com and dot org. That's why it's important to elect people who show up and say, imagine the power of investing in attaining wealth by investing in Olympia. Imagine that potential. And that's just electing a new generation of people. And this is why, as hard as it might sound, to have somebody stand up and talk to you about the political process in America, because there's every reason for us all to walk away from it now, but there's every reason for us to run toward it. There's three kinds of leaders, brothers and sisters. You know, there's people who have their heads down and don't want to see what's going on, and that's understandable. And in my business, there's so many people who just got to make payroll, and I get that. But then there's the second group, and, and you're in the room tonight. Man, you're people who take a break, and you stop, and you get to talk about the larger world. You lift your head above the din for just a little bit, you can see the larger world, and you can potentially see the future coming. Now, to be honest with you, most people put their heads back down, and that's cool. But there's a whole bunch of those second leaders that say, okay, I see the future coming, I'm gonna brace and wait for it to come to me, you know? And in the case of 80 million people getting old, wow, they're coming, oh, this is gonna hurt. The silver tsunami, they call it. <laughs> and that's not, a, that's not a nice term. But you know, I go back, to that idea I mentioned earlier about Robert Kennedy. Every time somebody acts out against injustice, it then sends forth that small ripple. You know, and that can create waves that wash down the mighty walls. I believe the silver tsunami can be actually the physical manifestation of that idea. Imagine 80 million baby boomers. Imagine 100 million millennials, each doing small, purposeful acts every single day. That's the power I believe in. And instead of waiting for that to happen, the third kind of leader, maybe you march out to meet the future. You say, I refuse to let that happen, even though the odds are stacked against me. Just like Rosa Parks, the odds were stacked against her. Just like Mahatma Gandhi, just like Dr. King, just like Malcolm X, just like Sojourner Truth, just like little tiny Harriet Tubman, the odds were stacked against them. But in the great arc of Americans, they stood up and said, no, not in my life, not in this country. And that's what I heard you. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Another thought. Yes, please. Wow, you that hand shot up. I didn't mean, mean long to say no, not to call you out. I've, I've listened to three other people ask questions, okay? <laughs> um, what obstacles did you run into and how did you overcome them? That's what we wanted to know. Well, it's, it's, it's always important to acknowledge that I'm a white man in America. So the obstacles, uh, you know, it, it, it's always, it would be wrong 
to not acknowledge that first and foremost. Because, you know, as, as many people already know, it, it's, there are many things, many doors that were open for me. Um, the two things that I was most flummoxed by, if you will, was A, in my, in my personal vision for this, this business idea, was the, uh, the pernicious urban myth that you still hear that it, the health department won't allow <coughs> restaurants or hotels to donate food. You still hear this. There's never, ever, ever been a law that, that made it illegal. In fact, every single state literally had a law that facilitated it. And I was lucky enough to work with the Clinton administration and Dan Glickman, who's the Secretary of Agriculture, on the first ever law, the national law, what's called the Bill Emerson Food Donor Act. And I got to go to the White House and watch Bill Clinton sign the first ever national food donor law. But that, that law, that idea of, of we can't do it, it's illegal, you still hear. But the more, the, the more frustrating thing for me was when I proposed my idea, as I suggested earlier, to all these charities, I was told it wouldn't work. And, and I consistently, and I say this with love, it's not a bad thing, it's just that, and, and I actually wrote a book challenging and, and frankly lambasting the nonprofit sector a little bit for their behaviors until I went to India to study the Indian National Congress. And again, that notion that Indians were divided and fighting each other, it was the neighbors whom I laughed out loud and realized that's a nonprofit sector in America. We fight each other versus finding common ground and working towards something. And we're pitted against each other to get a grant. And, and that, that pernicious system, that, that, that notion that we're indentured, like, those, like the women that Muhammad Yunus encountered, you know, we can't find our way out of this system. So I used to be very frustrated, and I still remain confused at times by the attitude of too many of my, my charitable brothers and sisters who can't let go of the service culture, just can't let go of selling pity. Um, I, 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 I understand it. Years ago, and you probably can't see it, but years ago I got this little tattoo of a heart here on this finger. So when I do this, I'm reminded of Lisa. You know. <laughs> Don't be a hater, dude. Don't be a hater. Because you know? I went through years of being judgmental, you know, thinking, thinking if they were just smart, you know, get it, you know, stupid nonprofits. I was blaming the players when it's really the game. And that's why I've become much more of a student of the idea of the economic empowerment of nonprofits and the political role that we should have in America. The Supreme Court says that businesses have First Amendment rights as people, but then they turn around in the same finding and say nonprofits don't. And I think that is patently illegal and must be challenged vigorously. Uh, and that's another part of the work I do. It's very interested in the political role of nonprofits in America in every city. I hope that answered your question. Yes, sir. Uh, you look like John Oliver, dude. Uh, <laughs> I mean that in a good way. I love John Oliver. Just like um, I guess my question has to do with have you had uh, difficulty with um, sort of civil contracting laws? Yes. Functionality and interfacing with government and the uh, regulations they have to do to make sure that they're, they're at the lowest cost and, and how can we address that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I, I, I'm frustrated that I understand. I, don't, I know this is kind of random, but I was really shocked. He was asking about oftentimes when you contract with the government, it's the lowest bid wins. You know, and I thought that was like school food and local stuff. I don't know if you remember, I watched the Benghazi hearings and Hillary Clinton said, hello. Our security for our embassies is based on lowest bid, and I was shocked that that goes all the way up to the very top. But you know what's interesting, and this is where government, and this is why I'm so adamant about electing people who understand social enterprise, because there are barriers to nonprofit participating. For example, in Washington, D.C., where I work, there was a 10% a or 10 point set aside for a minority owned business. Cool, cool, but the reality is I'm not an owned business. I could be 100% minority funded, staffed, and the board. But I'm not a business. So that put us at an economic disadvantage. I could never get those points. I was never be eligible. So the idea of trying to talk to the city about re-looking at their the way they give contracts, but I think more importantly is the reimbursement timeline. One of the great advantages I have in uh, Los Angeles is the California Community Foundation gave us a five hundred thousand dollar line of credit. Because this is the real key for business is being able to leverage debt. You know, how do you how do you basically hold the debt while you wait to be reimbursed by government. So just so you know, in some of the political work I've done, I've really proposed that there should not be anywhere in America, anywhere, at every level, at any level, an election in which candidates don't talk about their understanding of the role nonprofits play in their community and in the economy of their community and, and talk about the ideas of how they partner. And one of the things I've proposed 
is it you know, an office of strategic partnership. And I think every single mayor in, in America should have an office of strategic partnership in which, for example, in Denver, the mayor of, of, of Denver, John Hitzelhuber, um, was the first person to open one of these offices. A staff of three people um, were able to help nonprofits partner to get contracts with grants, and they brought $70 million of new money in over five years. Three people, $70 million. If I'm a mayor and I hear that number, it's like give me three people and give me six people and double that number. You know, but the idea of what are the laws that we need to change that would get more? You know, again, when I talked about the LA Kitchen and the idea of, you know, seven million direct purchases, $35 million in wages and all this other stuff, if I'm a mayor, I want to say to the city council, what do I need to do to get more of these, these kind of businesses? Because all they do is reinvest their profit over and over and over again. But of equal importance, and as much as you might kind of guffaw at the idea of Arnold Schwarzenegger's reign as governor of California, he was the first governor to appoint a volunteer coordinator to his cabinet, recognizing that energy, that part of it, his energy policy had to include the idea of millions of people who volunteer. You know, this is one of the greatest things we have in our country, man, the number of people who go out and contribute to their community. How many people in this community, how many people in this room have volunteered once in the last year? See, right on, man, look at how wealthy this town is. So, but it's electing people who understand that power. And that's a really, that's an imperative. So again, there shouldn't be a race anywhere in which you don't have a candidate's forum and you, you talk to the candidates. And this is, if you want another tactic, if you're interested in this, because again, sometimes, I know many of you are talking about the civil rights movement. One of the saddest things about our culture right now is that when somebody's really truly dangerous, first they get killed, then we make them a saint. And then we make a day after when we do, oh, they're a saint. Dr. King wasn't a saint. Mahatma Gandhi wasn't a saint. You know, Bono maybe, but not them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this idea that, that we, we make them into saints versus flawed men, but brilliant tacticians. That's what you should be studying. You know, that's what interests me. So I'm much more interested in this idea of, of tactics. And one of the tactics, if right now people say you're a nonprofit, you can't, like, for example, if you said to me, Robert, man, you're, you're a pro, man. 25 years you've been doing this, this poverty thing. Is there a candidate for office that you think that if we elected might really fundamentally change your business? It might really set a situation where you could diminish the need to raise more money or to collect more food? If I said, yeah, actually there is, and I just mentioned the candidate's name, in theory, the IRS could come and take away my 501c3 because I just and I just told you to vote for somebody. Now, that's illegal right now, right? But if I use this, which is literally a walkie-talkie to God, I can go on Twitter. And I can go on my own private Twitter account, ask him 14 million nonprofit employees on our own time. And I can go to a candidate and I can say, at candidate, nonprofits in this town are 10% of the economy, what's your plan? And we can do this every single day and relentlessly. It's like the press conference that never ends. And that's power. No, dudes, this is power. You know, so this is the kind of thing is if somebody puts a barrier up in front of you, don't curse the person who put the barrier up. Double down on how do I get around it? I will not be stopped. It's just I have to sometimes be cleverer than you know the person in front of me. Yes. So you mentioned the um, struggle for nonprofits to get funding and the struggle with each other. How have you negotiated that issue? That it's difficult for nonprofits to maintain the funding that. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in where is there opportunities to collaborate. Like, for example, we've been told there's here's a plan, we have to all go for it, but is there another opportunity where we might come together and form coalitions of sorts? You know, um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Maria. Maria. If you had Maria's strike meter across the street from Robert's strike meter out on um, whatever main street out here, every morning when I turn the corner, I'm praying that there's fire trucks in front of Maria's, you know? Or if they're leading you out of handcuffs because you have a fencing operation, I am just, thank God, Maria's is closed. But if somebody wants to come into town and regulate small business in a way that affects us, you and I might not drive down together, but we would look to the Chamber of Commerce or the Board of Trade as a vehicle to express our joint displeasure. And we might end up being on the same committee together. There are moments in the business community where they've learned to put aside their petty squabbles to stand together to fight for something bigger. And that's something I think nonprofits can learn from. And that might also include the idea of how do we get access to capital. Now, 
lecture on a little, little thing just to frankly debate colleagues in the sector saying that the most important word for nonprofits now in the current economy was merger. And I knew what was going to happen. They'd all freak out. Oh, I merger's bad. You know, it's like, ah, that's exhibit A. Your own mentality, you thought I meant, were weak. And because the economy is so tough that we must, you know, kind of shrink down to something. And while that's not an illegitimate discussion, can two become one? What I was saying is, well, there's other ways we can merge. What would happen if, if the top 40 nonprofits of Olympia got together and merged their banking business? Not their money, but their business, and shopped it out. And said, which bank wants our combined business? And don't forget, this university is a nonprofit. The hospitals are nonprofit. The art gallery is a nonprofit. The churches and synagogues and mosques are nonprofits. Imagine the political power, you know, and the economic power. But the ability to say, whoever gets our combined business, we want to see on the board of that bank. You know, or we want access to capital so we can escape the grain system and don't have to fight anymore. You know, if we owned our own businesses, if we owned our own economy that way, we could actually give credit cards to our constituents at non non-predatory non, non -predatory interest rates. We could actually invest in other businesses. We could become developers. You know, that's what interests me. Take it up a different level. Again, I've already talked about our merge voices and our votes. And I've talked a little bit about the idea of, of asking volunteers to use their combined um, purchasing power when they leave our organization. These are the ways that I think we can start to look at coalitions in which we can escape this trap. But at the same time, though, individually, and this is true of all of us, we're all on our own journeys. And you have to decide what kind of person, what kind of business you want to be part of. What do you want to stand for? This is probably the most challenging thing, I think, for a younger generation. As I said, we've talked a little bit about the idea of what is happiness, what is success, what kind of business are you going to be? You know, one of the hardest things in my business, hardest thing right now, is the money for food charities in America. Who do you think are the top funders of food charities in America right now? Any ideas? Walmart. Walmart, ConAgra, <coughs> Monsanto, and Kraft. So, in theory, if we want to be activists in the vein of some of the Americans, the great Americans I mentioned earlier, we have to basically get a grant in which we say when we sign it, none of this money will be used for political engagement. So right there, we advocate. But how are you going to talk about wage? How are you going to talk about nutrition if your money is coming from those sources? And these are the, these are the, the really tough, real tough issues that not part of face in the current system, which is why I'm turning a little bit more. And I know, I, I think I'm in a very unique position. This isn't as easy for other groups, but that idea of turning to government and saying, look, you've got all of this money that you're spending in local contracts. Let's start to talk about a new equation in which we can participate. But if you want to talk, or anybody wants to talk about this stuff, I'm always, I'm easy to find. I'm just rager at lakitchen.org. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to anybody anytime. I'm open source and I'll share what I have. We can be Facebook friends, whatever. I, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm interested in how a nonprofit can get a big loan from a bank because I think the bank, uh, the bank is asking, well, how's a nonprofit going to pay us back and how can they be reliable? But my other, my other question is one of the cornerstones of the DC mission is that you arrange for the people who give the food, the restaurants, etc., to receive uh, a tax break or something like that. And they, they get something back mm -hmm. for giving away. How uh, that, that kind of calculus that, that the donor, the giver, gets something out of it that's financial, if nothing else, but what, 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 what do people who give money for, for your projects what do they want in return from you? Well, that, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in quid pro quo, the, the old Latin term for business, both sides benefit. You know, historically, again, the old thing was, I'm going to give the cheer, it was ashes and sackcloth. Um, and as I suggested earlier, I don't think people were really being served. They were participating, but they weren't really being served in a way that was uplifting. Again, people on the street were being fed, but they were out the rain. People in the truck were serving the poor, but there was this, again, this uneven sense. I just tried to think for, level it out a little bit. Now, what's fascinating, I said this earlier, but one of the, the more interesting barriers I met, encountered, was people who thought I was naive to suggest that men and women who were formerly homeless, 
you know, I didn't really bring people directly onto the street. We set up a ladder so that we supply food to street level programs and then to emergency shelters, then to day treatment programs, then to transitional homes. So in fact, we were supplying very strategic partners that would help people feel heal physically well, they provided the other services, so when they got to a certain level they could come to our program, they were physically and spiritually and, and uh, set as far as, you know, home and all that other stuff. But nonetheless, um, a lot of people within the charitable world said, boy, dude, you are naive to think that a restaurant's going to hire somebody who's homeless. And I was like, you've never worked in a restaurant. Right. <laughs> I was thinking that's the island of misfit toys in the back of most restaurants. You know? <laughs> so... Um, but that idea that everyone could benefit, you know, so part of the incentive, because think about it, if I went to the average restaurant tour and said, would you give me food to feed the poor? Restaurant people are really decent people, best people in the world. But, you know, I think many would think, why am I going to give you food to feed the poor when I've got that person you want to feed sitting in front of my restaurant all day long, handheld harassing my customers? You know, I don't want to help with that. Are you kidding? What I was saying is, if you give me that food, A, I'll show up when it's convenient for you. I'll provide a container. The drivers will be certified food handlers. I'll give you a, I'll weigh your thing, and you can go to your accountant and determine a tax deduction for it. We'll decrease the trash cost. We'll decrease the pest control cost. I'll give you a sticker for your window that lets your customers know that you don't throw away food. We'll increase the morale of your staff when they work in a company that doesn't participate in food. And I'll use you for your food to train somebody for a job who can then come and work for you and help you make more money. And will decrease the cost that the city has to pay, which will decrease your taxes. Yeah. How many different wins were there? But this is what's interesting, though. At the end of the day, if that, if that restaurant tour can figure out how to not give me food, that's their number one center. How do I cut waste? This is what's been interesting, and this is kind of why I've chosen this new track. And I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of the intellectual journey I'm on. Because I was watching during the 1990s and 2000s, as you could see, from a distance off, the amount of food that was coming into shelters and pantries decreasing. Because again, it's lost profit. The industry was figuring it out. And what was left was poison. You know, in fact, here we had built a charitable food system that was actually poisoning poor people in the name of eating them. You know? And so, A, I was looking at that, but then uh, I did a speech for Meals on Wheels in 2003, in which the president of the association told me there was a waiting list in half of American cities for Meals on Wheels. And it's like, but the first baby boomer doesn't turn 60 until 2006. You've got a waiting list now, and the 80 million that are coming are three years out, and the charitable system that feeds the poor has less food coming in. That's what got me really thinking towards this move to California and this idea of, is there a new quid pro quo? Again, but instead of the traditional charity models that the incentive was ultimately going to be on the business to uh, cut off my supply, I wanted to reverse it and said, instead of just doing charity, I'll start to buy products. In other words, I'll give them the incentive they want. Instead of losing money, they'll make money. So it's just coming up with new incentives. And that's true not just for business, but as we went through the arc, and this is also really important for those of you who share the world. It's the same thing for us in this business. Too many of us have a system in which we expect every single client to come in and fit into our one box. You know, when I started the DC Central Kitchen, we were primarily serving men and women who were heroin or alcohol addicts. Then came crack. Crack was a crazy different drug. Then in 1996 came welfare reform. You know, and that was primarily women who didn't have work history and oftentimes had to graduate high school and had child care issues. Then came felons. Each group demanded that we adapt, not the other way around. So again, this idea of, of what are the incentives for each of those different groups and how can our organization bend to meet those needs. Now this is really important because if you look at the, at the food system we have now, whether, and again, this is no disrespect. Sometimes I throw out these things and it makes me sound like I'm, I'm complaining or pointing fingers, but too often our pantry system, which remains the way we serve so many of the working poor food, they're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, not at night on the weekends when the single working mom really needs it the most. You know, and even though we're raking carefully in efforts to get fruits and vegetables, the question is, are the boxes of food we're giving this person adding to their, their time loads? In other words, we're saying, you know, here's a bunch of good stuff if you had an hour to cook. And for most people, it's like, I don't have an hour to cook. I'm working one job. I'm trying to get home before I have to, and cook a dinner before I have to, and get it, and then before I have to get the car and drive to Evergreen to continue my education. So what I'm interested in is, I, I think I mentioned earlier about campus kitchens, 60,000 school cafeterias in America, empty all afternoon, all weekend, all night. Imagine 
school cafeterias is a place where students might work partner with an intergenerational gardening program to buy the product they're making. So the kids in an after school cooking club who might also be getting remedial education in math because fractions and measuring cups are the same thing. You know, I believe the cafeterias are probably the greatest underutilized learning laboratory in America. You can teach math, science, history, social enterprise, social justice, nutrition, all at the same time. But imagine the idea of creating meals to go for working moms um, as a way to say, look, it's just a buck. But every buck comes in, we're going to use that. The kids can be little social entrepreneurs. We can be teaching business in school. And the students might be able, to, be able to raise the money to rehire the art instructor. They got cut because of the state budget. So this is a thing I'm always mad about. What are the things we have in our community? What are traditional barriers that we can potentially see over the top of and find new ways to use them? And what are the incentives for change? This is interesting. I hope it is. I mean, you are really great. I mean, and I'm not fishing. It's just that I'm, I'm really so impressed that you all are so intrigued. So. Nice. Um, hey. I'm just kind of curious on what you're talking about. about creating a law or policy that requires politicians and government officials to, per to participate in programs like this to help com combat uh, stereotypes, injustices, and, and inequality. Well, I'm, you know, what's interesting, though, is I tell you, I see tons of politicians coming out to do drive-bys. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's cool though because, again, it's an incentive. And again, my thing is I work with addicts and politicians. There ain't a lot of difference. You know, it's just, you know, we're all in recovery, sister. We're all in recovery. You know, so the idea is I just read everybody. Everybody's, a, everybody's on a journey, and if there's a way I can guide them in. Now, that being said, I think once nonprofits get over the idea that we can fix the problem, then you can start to in, in, invest in being diabolical. And that's what I try to do. I set traps, purposeful traps. So for example, in DC, I would have, as you can imagine, most people would think that the DC Central Kitchen was a magnet for liberal politicians, but actually conservative board in there at the same time because we're creating jobs and you know, so there was a little bit of something for everybody to like. But it was fascinating because oftentimes conservative brothers and sisters would come in and just see job creation. Right? They'd be like, this is a great program. You know, get the people job. We need more programs like this. And it's like, well, I, I'm glad you agree. This is truly agree. This is perfect. But you know, the reason these men wouldn't work is because we have a partner that's a great drug treatment program. If we have more money for drug treatment programs instead of prison, wow, I can create so many more jobs. <laughs> so it's an intellectual trap. And that was what was fun, is trying to just guide people to this greater truth. Again, we're not in the nonprofit business. We're in the bravery business. And sometimes people just need examples they can get their hands around. So, you know, again, this is why I was, in my earlier talk, I mentioned all those leaders, because it wasn't oftentimes the, the British or white Americans that convinced it was a problem. It was people who were actually participating in those subjugation. You know what I mean? So I'm very interested in that. How do we free ourselves first? So, but thank you. It's a really good question. Yes?
went through certain classes, they, they got an opportunity to use those computers to communicate with their kids. Now this is perfect, because we want to use the same computers to basically pre-screen people so that when they got out, they could come to our program. It was perfect, because these were men and women who established bonds with their children. That was a huge, huge plus for people who, again, this idea that someone's going to have a greater opportunity to keep on that road once they got out as people who established trust with their family. And so that was one way. Now what you're seeing in many prisons, some of you all may know this, is there are interest in, in, in prison-based agriculture. And I'm very interested in, again, if I have a contract, if the city says we want you to be the main, and I want to be LA's number one nutrition partner for senior nutrition, LA and LA counties. Uh, and that's going to be a, a, a gigantic opportunity. But I'm on the contract. So that means I can buy stuff. I can I can really be very well delivered about why I spend that money. Because I just don't want to spend it. I want to I want to prove points. I want to show the power of a deliberate partner with the community. So I might say there's a certain amount of farmers I want to deal with, but if I can buy from a prison and make that connection, so that somebody when they get out, they're like, I've been I've been part of this agri this prison farm system. When I get out, can I come up with you? I've been supplying you those fruits and vegetables, and I know I'm really excited because I know you're using them to feed my family. You know, imagine that connection of somebody saying, I want to be part of that. And this is what interests me because, you know, prison, we're all alike. Most people in America, at the end of the day and at the end of most people's lives, what do they want? I want to have done something of meaning. I want to have made a difference. That's all anybody wants. You know, we all get up and have to go to work, even as much as I love my job, there's days when it's like, oh my goodness. You know, and, and believe me, brothers and sisters, man, you know, I've had a good run, but I'm 56, and I'm doing a startup again. You know, I'm waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning wondering about I'm going to make payroll. I've made payroll for 26 years, you know, and that idea of missing a payroll was terrifying. But I'm in that back of that nonprofit thing. How am I going to get that plan to make that payroll? How am I going to pay back that $10 million? Is this thing even going to work? You know, it really is. Well, plus I'm delivering food again. I deliver meals because we don't have, you know, this is a startup. I don't have a big team anymore. Somebody goes to the bank, it's like, oh, wait, i got to go to the bank. I'm back in that, that place again. But I'm like everybody. I just want to be part of something bigger, older, better. You know, and I think that if I can offer that opportunity, that opportunity to someone home from prison, um, that's great. Now, equally, as hard as it is to believe, and many of us have had the opposite experience, but I've found that there's many people within the prison industrial complex that actually want to be good POs. And they want to help people get through the system. And those are the people I look for. You know, who is it up to that really, and we have to do a lot of, a lot of testing. You know, not of the men and women we serve, but the, the men and women are supposed to be served now. You know, who are the real partners? We just graduated our second class. And of course, I had to go to a new city and determine where are the men and women who are going to supply us with young men and women aging out of foster care who were stable, who have housing. What are the organizations that are going to work with us to supply the men and women home from prison? You know, who are the real, who are the people who are really going to be great partners versus who are the organizations that are just talking? And our first class was a dismal failure because a lot of the people we thought would be great partners just didn't work out. It doesn't mean I don't want to work with them yet, it's just I understand they have limits. But the second class, we just graduated a week and a half ago, we had 85% retention of the men and women who started and finished and 60% employment on graduation day. And of course, my goal in the future is basically be an employer for the majority of each class. I'd like to be a major employer. But the point is we've had to partner with lots of different people. Judges, I know there's a bunch of judges who are just really twisted up in knots because of what they see. They want a partner too. So what I've discovered in the system is that if you build something really good, there's a whole bunch of people who want a partner. Yeah, it is like that. And I know seriously, I try to avoid saying, yeah. I just, you know, by the way, you know, I just met Kevin Costner. Isn't that funny? She just said they go, but they will, they will come. But she makes it us hang with Kevin Costner. All weird. So, Dr. 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 Edgar. Oh, isn't that so cool? You have given me much to think about when I leave here this evening. Um, but now I'd like to give you something to think about. And you said you never went to college. It's never to. I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm here. The, all of us that are in roughly the same age group as you are here, just so I decided to throw that out to you to think about it. No, I will. I mean, you know, again, that's a joy of a good Learning things I didn't life. know that I should learn. Yeah, so. no, I appreciate that very much. Lifelong learning. Anybody else said yes? Wow. So, I have a question. Uh, first of all, awesome. Blown my mind multiple times. Um, so just someone just starting out, um, you kind of talked about 
about kind of the struggles and everything. Um, but somebody starting out that has the great big ideas of multiple directions to go in, um, however, is already coming across the naysayers of it won't work, or oh, we already have this, why start it again, or oh, that sounds like this program, et cetera. Um, what, I guess, advice or kind of, I guess, maybe inspiration possibly can you give to those? Well, good. this is why. Yeah, I'm very deliberate because when I started the kitchen, people said it wouldn't work. And so I just I despise that culture that won't work or we don't need that. You know, no one, no one ever says, oh, Olympia's got too many dry cleaners, no more dry cleaners. Or no more, you know, for all intents purposes, nobody says that about for profit businesses. Yet they tell us that there's too many of us. No. No, we can do it better. And it's always, it, it's always, I think, appropriate to determine whether there's an organization you might partner up with just because it is tough. There is. To a certain extent, a saturated market, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't open your program. And it's also the reason I'll always um, answer an email if you want to talk about your your situation and if I can help. You know, I'll always be there because you know it's it paid for it, sister. You know, your turn will come. You'll be the great wise old person someday. You know, it'll be your turn to say anybody can call me. Uh, but no one. Again, there's the hardest part. I think is. Just that 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 fierce dog of determination, you know. But if I can give you any piece of advice, no one wakes up when they're 25 and looks in the mirror and says, "Man, when I grow up, I'm going to be a born bureaucrat that cycles innovation in a nonprofit." <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it begs the question: How do people who are fiery, determined, passionate young people fall into that trap? They're not bad people. It's just they, 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 it's just, and it's not a conscious decision. So it really is. You have to really determine your your path, your, your and follow this. And it can be very difficult because there will be lots of naysayers. There'll be lots of shortcuts. There will be lots of um, siren songs calling to you, you know, off your path. You have to really work hard to determine the kind of person you're going to be, the kind of business you want to run, and and really stick with things. Because the only reason I'm here. Seriously, is 25 years of pumping it out every day in the basement of the biggest shelter in America. 25 years, man. And I can look back now and it just seems like this fuzzy, glorious thing. It was hard. It was really, really hard. I mean, you know, when you've got a shelter above you, it was the biggest shelter in America, 4,000 people. And if I, it, it, I think I can say gravity, gravity's not fun in a big shelter, you know? You get my drift? You know, it was when you're in the basement, it was, it was hard sometimes. There was no heat. There was no air conditioning. It was a hot, cold, cramped. My office was a mop closet. 24 years, I was in a mop closet. But the point is I was committed to this journey. This is what I'm going to do. I go to my high school reunions, um, that first tenure reunion. You know, people are like, oh, yeah, they you in that homeless thing, right? I say, yeah, 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 I'm doing that homeless thing. 20 years later, do you still doing that homeless thing? It's like, that's what I do. You know, it's not, you know, it's not a, a whim, you know, this is my, I'm pro, this is what I do. 25 years, you know what people are saying? Dude, you made the right choice. You know, I wish I had, I wish I had done something like that. And I was not shocked, actually, because a lot of my friends were actually really good people. They just, they projected upon me, and many of us, this idea of, oh, you're such a good person. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm a sinner. Dude, I'm a sinner. You know, in fact, I'm a joyful sinner. You know, anybody, anybody from tequila, I'll drink right now. You know? But the point is, I'm, I'm dedicated to this journey. And that's what I urge you to consider doing. And you'll be surprised how much you can weather, you know, um, if you just really commit. And again, if I may be just one more thing. And I know this is really aimed more at, at younger people, but there's never, there's no age limit on friendship. And the idea that you should really work hard to be a good friend, you know, because the best thing you can have in life when you're really facing hard, brutal obstacles is a friend, you know? And, and so that idea of really nurturing your friendships. I mean, it's funny, I went around today and I bought a bunch of postcards. I travel with postcard stamps and I send postcards constantly to friends. And it's so simple, you're prettier than this, this made me think of you. It's just simple, kind gestures that, that remind people that they're important to me. Because when there's moments in my life when I'm down, and I'm really up against it. And again, this has been the hardest year of my career. This last year has been the hardest year of my career. Having to prove myself all over again. Having to go get that loan, which was not easy. And just so you know, by the way, for anybody's interested, 
It wasn't a traditional loan. There's a new vehicle within the nonprofit sector called a PRI loan, which stands for a Program Related Investment, which in effect is a new toy for many of our philanthropic brothers and sisters. And in effect, it's a, it's a grant that you pay back over a long period of time with a very low interest rate. So it's very different from a traditional loan, but it's a new mechanism for nonprofits to give them access to capital that they need. So it's, it's a new experiment. And I think our brothers and sisters in philanthropy should be congratulated on that. So. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. So I'm a person with the passion and, and all of the ideas, but the business side of it and whatnot is terrifying to me. And I have ideas for change and, and my heart it explodes with my desire to make changes with transitional living and that kind of thing. What is the best method for networking with people and with people that can help facilitate getting the two million dollars and you know property and getting roadblocks taken out of the way for for land to build tiny town and to that we talked about earlier. Okay. You know, what? Dude, it's funny, because normally I think that boards can be actually a millstone around our neck. But that being said, there's a town full of people, and I mentioned those baby boomers, you know? There's a whole bunch of people who are like, maybe in this room, it's like, I've been a real estate agent all my life. I really want to do something. Maybe I can help build tiny town. You know, there's, there's all kinds of people who are looking for a way in. Now, one thing that I find fascinating, just a, a way to kind of talk about breaking free of tradition, Historically, when you start to think about a board, if I'm my own advice, you can look for a board that has good connections, but don't look for a board that you think, oh, they're rich, they'll give you money. That's not, that never works. And I always say that you chase money, you run forever. Chase results, and money comes to you. That's just some advice. But um, when you start to build your board, historically, the construct in the nonprofit sector is you get somebody for two, three year terms. You know, which means, honestly, you can be stuck with a real piece of dead wood for six years. So I'm investigating the idea of a project-driven term. So in other words, you might say, well, I need a board, but I don't want a six-year board. I just want somebody to help me build this part of my business. And once that's done, your board term is up, and you can split, and I'll bring somebody else to take you to the next level. So this is the way you can attract the kind of talent you want, but give them the out that they might want also. So, but again, I think that this town's full of people who will help you. And this is, I think, the power of the, the boomers in keeping them engaged. Yes, you got a question up there? And by the way, facetiously, we're calling it a tiny town, but my brother has a plan for using a um, small housing movement to build a transitional housing community based in a small, small town versus the big shelter concept. Um, okay, I recently learned in my class, uh, the art and science of sport, that the NFL is a non-profit organization. And it's been revolving in my mind how a nonprofit organization makes so much money and don't pay any taxes. Well, you know, now in theory, the Catholic Church is a nonprofit. And that's probably one of the richest organizations. So, but there does need to be, I think there, there is inevitably going to be a discussion about what is a typical 501c3 charity, which most people think as a human service kind of thing, versus this university is a nonprofit. Hospitals and nonprofits. Now, what's interesting you see in many cities, particularly those that are struggling economically, is legislators that are looking at imposing what they call um, a pilot program payment in lieu of taxes. And in effect, they're basically saying nonprofits, we know you're tax exempt and you don't really have to pay taxes on your property, but you own so much. You know, we'd like to kind of strong arm you to pay a little bit to the city. And so this is a big, big discussion around America. What does the 501c3 look like? This is part of um, a predictable review of the tax code that's coming up. So we'll see what happens. But I think the, the NFL is probably one of the more interesting examples of what this, you know, back in 1968, there was only 60 some thousand charities in America. You know, this explosion is something very new. Um, and it also happened to coincide, if you're interested in this, um, women in the workforce, only about 21% of the workforce in the early 1960s, and nonprofits only about 60,000 nonprofits. When women came pouring into the workforce in the 1970s, either because the economy had changed and they had to work, or because they wanted to work. Nonetheless, suddenly nonprofits went up to 1 million in 15 years. 
And what I think you can see happen, my mother's generation, this was a generation of women who were, for all intents and purposes, told because they had spent these years, formative years, being wives and mothers, they didn't have any skills. And they were pushed into this charity box. And with that, the rules that govern charities in America are, in my opinion, very grounded in this gender bias, this, this uh, economic sexism that says if you're a charity, you're not really a business. This is where we women businesses run. They don't have access to capital. They don't have access to the political process. In fact, what's interesting is when these, this first generation of women went out to start their nonprofits and they went to the foundation world, they encountered, in effect, a system in which white men were giving away other white men's money. And they weren't going to allow these women to build businesses that would challenge the status quo of the system that made this money. And in fact, you still see it's a Rockefeller Carnegie model that says, in effect, the role in America is to make a whole bunch of money by any means necessary, and then towards the end of your life, to you give a little back to try and offset the damage you did making a whole bunch of money. And this is a horribly flawed construct that we have to challenge. So I'm more interested in the idea that philanthropy is daily life. Philanthropy is how you make your money, philanthropy is how you spend your money. So again, it goes back to this idea of nonprofits giving people the opportunity to support businesses that keep the money local as a way to get both the goods and services of capitalism, but the joyous returns of philanthropy at the same time. I think this is capitalism 2.0, as I like to call it, economic Buddhism, the middle path. <laughs> yes? How does it square with you that all these pe all the people that give money, uh, give philanthropic, you know, leave, at the end of the year, if if you get five dollars to UNICEF, you don't expect a check for that back at the end of the year. But if someone who has a billion dollars gives a hundred, they just they expect fifty dollars back at the end of the year. If, it's like in a restaurant with tips. If you give someone a tip, it's because they did a good job. They don't deserve that money back in the tax. So the, there's a disparity in the rich and the poor. So why, if a poor guy poor gives five bucks, they don't expect it back, but if a billionaire gives five bucks, they deserve 10 bucks back. Yeah, you know, it's funny, man, we really haven't explored, you know, honestly, we've, we've allowed this understandable idea of charity to just kind of float along. And, and I'll be honest with you, I was, you know, I'm not that, that smart dude, but I was one of the, the first people to come along and really look at it and say, you know, this is like the third biggest employer in America now. This, this is suddenly, I think people are waking up and realizing that while charity in America has become a really big business, and that's both good and bad, there is, in effect, a charitable industrial complex, and people who protect that, and there's people who want to liberate us from that system. So it's a very, very fluid time right now. This is my concern, though. As you can see, legislation coming, it's more about getting our assets than it is giving us an equal say in the process. And I'm just, I, I think this is why not I, so uh, fundamentally committed to the idea of nonprofit being engaged in the local process. Did I hear a yes? Oh, I thought I heard an affirmation back there. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Ulysses, nice to see you. Thomas of Dealings with Social Purpose Corporations. Well, you know, it's fun right now, man. There's all kinds of experiments. You have B corporations, you know. Um, uh, in fact, I think in Washington State, there was legislation to kind of create a, a, an easier vehicle, a kind of a B corporation, maybe a C corporation, for lack of a better phrase. You have the LC3. You have PRI grants. Suddenly, things are loosening up, but not at the level I think our economy demands. I, I, when I go back this over and over, I cannot believe that uh, in the last presidential election, President Obama, who got his first job in nonprofit, and Michelle Obama got her first job in nonprofit, nor Governor Romney, neither one of them used the word nonprofit in the last state of the union. The president did not mention philanthropy or nonprofits, even though we were are the third biggest employer in America. Can you imagine um, if I was the CEO, you were the stockholders of the company, and our market share was slipping quickly? And you would call the double secret meeting, and I was the CEO, and I had to stand in front of you to tell you how I was going to turn the ship around. And I went through the whole presentation, and suddenly you all looked around and said, he's not talking about our third biggest division. And you'd fire me. I wouldn't have your trust. Yet we consistently elect people who ignore the third biggest division in the American economy. And so this isn't necessarily yay not profits as much as this isn't serving America well right now. So again, this is why I'm, I'm adamant as a, as a citizen taxpayer, as a father. You know, um, this is something that I think really limits us 
at this very critical time in our economy. And again, what you see constantly and sadly is mayors being elected think the only way they can grow their economy is to float bonds to build a stadium or to attract a big store. You know? And I think this idea of, instead of the idea of a, a big business, I'm a big believer in thousands and thousands and thousands of small businesses you know, supported by, an, by a local community that may have to be sold the idea of paying a little bit more but getting a whole lot back. And this is why I think mayors are important. I would love to see mayors who stand up in front of cities and say, look, you've got to shop in these stores. I mean, look for our label because I don't want to raise your taxes. I don't want to be the one to have to raise your taxes. But the reality is, if we don't keep this money local, I have no choice to spend your money. You might have to spend a little bit more, but it's going to be easier at the end of the year when I don't have to raise taxes on you, whether it's your property taxes or a gas tax or whatever. So I would love to find, and I'd like to help elect people who show up on day one really committed to a much broader approach to our economic recovery than just the you know, business. One more? Please, I guess you're right here. Here's a lucky one. Two? Okay. Don't forget high fest. Don't forget <laughs> high fest. Okay, I hadn't planned on really saying anything, but you've inspired me. And part of what I wanted to say is I work for the Department of Corrections, and I have for 16 years. 16 years ago, we handed you $40 and dropped you off at the bottom of the hill, you know, put you on a bus. And now, in order, before you're released, you know, you're going through a lot of programming and releasing, and you're jumping through hoops. However, what I really wanted to say is, what we're doing now in the Department of Corrections is a lot of sustainability, we're growing our own foods, and we have what we call CIPCs at each prison, and there's one at our prison that works just insane. Just, I couldn't do what she does. However, I'm inspired tomorrow when I go back to work to talk with her, because when I'm in the, we call it the town hall, when I'm in the inmate kitchen, the offenders are like so excited. Hey, look, this big person, you know, like, you know, the first fries we have today are, you know, we, we grew them, or what have you. And Why not? they, oh, it's so awesome. It's so amazing because these guys take what little bit we give them now with budget cuts and everything else in the last few years, and they make amazing food. Like food, you probably can't even get it a lot, a lot of restaurants for $2.50 as an employee. So, but I'm curious now, you've got my mind spinning in terms of how can we connect that with probation officers, with the food that we have that we're not utilizing, and where can we get it to? Right. And then when these guys are releasing, what kind of role can they play in it? So I'm really excited to think about you know, spending some time with Don tomorrow and throwing some of this out and saying, okay, so, because I know we have food that we are utilizing in terms of sustainability, you know, we're putting it back in the gardens, what have you, but could that food be going somewhere else? Totally. You know, this is what you're talking about, Matt, is the, is the real power of food. This is what it says about food. I'm not a food person like that. I'm not, I'll, I'll eat anything. You know, I'm not a snob that way. I'm not a foodie that way. I just believe passionately in the power of food as a liberating tool. You know, I say food, using food as a tool to strengthen bodies, empower minds, and build community all at the same time. But the, the missing ingredient, what I urge people in this room to think about, and this is what the mayor of Tiny Town and I were talking about, is how do we create those businesses? So in fact, we're saying, no man, send them to us. You've got men and women who already have, have done agriculture. They already understand how to make all kinds of crazy stuff. Send them to me, man. I'll create the business. I'll make the profit. You know, I'm sorry for our for-profit brothers who don't see this opportunity. I do. And I think that that's the key is, to, is for more and more and more nonprofits to, again, recognize that our job is to become these employers because our incentive isn't the Milton Friedman-esque, I'm gonna have to take the money and give it to the shop boys. Our model is we reinvest it back in the community. We're a mayor's best friend. So that idea of, I'm hoping that the LA Kitchen will be a very powerful business, but I hope it will be just one of a growing number of examples 
Pioneer Human Services, others that people can look to and say, can we do that too? You know, and that's why I'm open source. I'm not trying to open LA kitchens around, I'm just trying to help other people recognize that they have tremendous potential in their own town to become employers. And whether it's my sister back here who's saying, in fact, I'm running into those obstacles now, you know, it's like stick with it, become that employer. So I think that's what many of us are trying to do. In effect, I know it sounds bold to say, but this is why I, 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 one of my favorite Americans is Harriet Tubman. Favorite people. Um, and you know what's wild about her is she didn't even, she didn't weigh 100 pounds, and she wasn't even five feet tall. And that's like 12 year old girl size. That's, that's, that's so diminutive. Yet she 19 times went down and pulled people out. You know, and that's, that's really what inspires this idea of it's not your job to build something, it's your job to guide people. You know, that's, that's, the, jo that's the joy of what we do. It's, it's being an early adapter, yeah, because I have resources, other the least of which is the fact that I'm a white dude, but I mean, I have resources I can use. If I can open that door, I'm just opening it. So there's, in fact, as a young man, I was, I was blessed, I mentioned earlier, running nightclubs, but I was, I was, I was blessed so, so I, I saw some of you had entertainment, man, but I got to see JB, the godfather of soul, the hard working man in show business, James Brown. And James Brown had a song that just still to this day, it's so much at the core of what I do, and it says, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Just open the door, I'll get it myself. That's what a great organization does. All we do is open the door a little bit wider. So on that note, beautiful Olympia man, rock on. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on the